I'd love to. And as we've been reading through the Bible every day, who's up to date? Everybody up to date? Yeah. I made a commitment, because last time I didn't do so well when we did this like eight years ago. But this time I made a commitment I'm going to do it the first thing every morning. And for me, that's the only way to make sure that I get it done, that it's my priority, and so it's the first thing I do. I get my coffee, pick up my phone, and read on the Bible app and do that before I check any emails or do anything else. And so that's, that's working for me. Um, so as we've read through the Bible up to this point, and we're in Judges now starting this week, um, there's something that's been there the whole time through the end of Genesis and Exodus, and really it has its roots in Genesis with uh, Cain and Abel, and and then the sin that Adam and Eve committed, and then Abraham. There's there's the beginnings of this idea of tabernacle, and then we see that God tells Moses some very specific, detailed things about how to build a place that He will come and inhabit and dwell in the midst of His people while they are sojourning between Egypt and the Promised Land and the 40 years that they wandered in the desert. So I want us to look at the tabernacle this morning and look at all of the elements and the different things that are going on there because there's quite a lot of moving parts to this thing. And so I hope that this will help you have a better understanding of Leviticus especially because, I mean, Leviticus is just consumed with all the details of the tabernacle and the priests and the priesthood and all of their articles of clothing and all of the implements of worship that they were using and the rituals that are going on. And perhaps this morning with it, and we have quite a few visuals to help us visualize what is happening there in the tabernacle. The other thing I want to be sure to bring out this morning is that Jesus Christ is in the tabernacle. He is there from Genesis all the way to Re Revelation. Christ is in the Old Testament and he's in the worship that is going on, although it is not clearly seen unless you know what the symbols are, unless you understand what's going on. Then you begin to clearly see Christ throughout the Old Testament. So here's a, a picture of what we think the tabernacle probably looked like based on all of the description of the details of how it was built and how it was assembled. And, of course, archaeologists don't have any of the exact parts of the tabernacle, but they're aware of the style and the way things were done prehistorically, pre Christ during this age of how the workmanship was done and what it might have looked like. And so this is just kind of a, a big picture view of the tabernacle. You see that there is a fence or a wall all around the outer court. And I have, I'm going to go back and forth a little bit on some of these. Here's one that is a, an overview looking down at the tabernacle and so there's a fence all the way around it and that defines what's called the outer court. The dimensions of this thing were approximately, some people just say 150 by 75, but then we know if you were reading the Bible says that so many cubits and, and everything is measured in cubits. Well the cubit is the distance from your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. And that can be anywhere from 18 to 22 and a half or 3 inches, depending on how long your bones in your arms are and how tall you are in the frame of your body. And so, with that in mind, it could have been as long as 175 feet long and 87 and a half feet wide. It's about roughly the fourth to a third of the size of a football field. Um, if you want to think about that and visualize that. Now can I go back? 
So there's the fence around it, and that's the outer court. And then you see at this end, there's um, an opening that's different. And that is, they called it the gate, although it was not made of wood or metal. It was made of hides, and a lot of this was made of the skins of different animals and cloth that was woven. The gate was woven cloth that was very ornate, um, tapestry-like material that was woven with different colored threads and very thick and several layers that formed this gate at the opening of the tabernacle. And that was the only way to come in was through the gate. There was no other openings anywhere around. The gate and the, the end, this end of it always faced east. Whenever they would set it up um, as they were traveling and they would make camp, it would always be set up with the gate towards the east. So everything is facing east. And then if you remember reading, the tribes were all allocated a position around the tabernacle. It was in the very center of the camp, always right in the center, putting God and his dwelling place in the center of the nation as they camped and as they traveled. And so there would be three tribes on each of the four sides, and it's listed out in there. I'm not going to go through all of those details because we could take a long, long time if we wanted to get back into all those details. I'm just hoping to give you a good overview this morning of what's going on with the tabernacle. So you enter through the gate. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, he says, I'm the door. I am the way, the straight and narrow way. It's the only way to come into God's presence is by way of Christ. Tabernacle literally means a dwelling place or place of dwelling. Um, it's not a word that we use too much anymore. Um, this particular building and the church that met in this building in the 80s was known as Gospel Tabernacle. And in the charismatic movement, there was a renewal of the ideas of worship within the tabernacle and that the tabernacle was a place where God dwelt among his people and one of our favorite passages of scripture in those days was that God inhabits the praises of his people and I'm going to get to that toward the end of this but tabernacle he says wherever two or three are gathered there I am in the midst of them you know God wanted a dwelling place with his people from Adam and Eve when he created Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden and it says he would come there and walk with them and dwell with them there in the garden before they sinned and of course we know after they sinned they were shut out from the garden and shut away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life and what was posted at the door the gate to the garden in Genesis, two seraphim or cherubim, angels with flaming swords guarding the gate. Remember that because when we get into the tabernacle, we're going to see that there are seraphim and cherubim embroidered and, and guarding the gate, the way into the presence of God. And we know in the book of Revelation, it says that there are four beasts or angels that are part of the four sides of the, around the throne of God. The tabernacle consisted of, consisted of three areas. I've already mentioned the outer court, which was surrounded by this fence that was eight or eight and a half feet tall. Um, and then inside that area was the tent of meeting, which is what we typically, when we say tabernacle, we're just thinking about that part of it. But really the whole thing was part of, of the tabernacle. But the tent of meeting was the inner court area. And that was divided into two parts. The holy place, which was just inside the door to that tent. And then 
divided again by the veil, and the veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Get into those just a little bit more. Again, here's the overview. Um, we see that it was eight and a half feet high or so, and those are the dimensions. If you're looking down, the first thing you see as you walk through the gate, and if I know how to use the laser. Yeah, here we are. This right here is the altar for burnt offerings, the brazen altar. And that's the next thing that we're going to talk about. We don't know about some of these other things. I think they were just added for illustration. And you know, certainly they had to have some means to deal with all this sacrificing that was going on. A place to, to slaughter the animals. And so that's what these items now there it is, um, are depicting here in the outer court. So the brazen altar is the first thing I want to talk about when you come in. And that's as far as the common people that were not Levites or priests could come. They could come into the outer court and just around the area of the brazen altar and where the sacrifices were. And there were sacrifices going on here day and night. Um, at least twice a day, there were sacrifices being made every day. And so there were all these different kinds of sacrifices. There was burnt offerings, there were sin offerings, grain offerings, drink offerings that were made. And the people would bring them and come to the priests and come to this area. And as you can tell, this thing was really just like a very large barbecue. I mean, it was an open pit um, type barbecue grill. When I was growing up, we had something like that at our house that my dad had built out of brick and concrete block. That was just this, and it was fairly big, big blocked up area. And then it had a screen grate over the top and some openings around the side that you would put the fire in and then you could cook mostly I think we cooked chickens but then sometimes hamburgers or whatever on that thing we had Brenda and I had one at um, the house on Floral Avenue if any of you remember there's only a handful of folks that would know where that is but anyway there was one of those in our backyard but it had a chimney on it as well as a big open fire grate but that's basically what it was and so there were wood fire and coals of fire underneath it that were going, you know, burning. And if you remember when you read about the consecration of the tabernacle, when they did this the first time, they piled the wood in there and God set it on fire. He came down and created that fire. And then, of course, the tradition or the idea is that that fire that God created there under that altar never went out. They continued to pile wood on it and to keep those coals burning perpetually. That fire not going out, not being quenched. Just always being continually refueled. And then when they would move, they had some way of, of moving those hot coals and carrying it and setting up and, and starting the fire again. So that that fire just was on and went on and on and on forever. So the people would bring their sacrifices, their animals. Either it was a lamb without blemish or spot, or they, they, for some offerings they would bring a goat. And if they were not um, wealthy enough to have flocks, they could bring um, a dove or a pigeon, or even, in some cases, you know, a measure of flour. And they would bring it, and then the person offering the sacrifice was required to put their hand on the animal first. That symbolized them imparting or transposing their sin onto this animal. And then they, and, and I didn't know this until doing a little more research or whatever, they actually participated in the slaughtering of that animal, of letting that blood along with the priest. And of course, you know, they would cut the animal's throat and, and the blood would come out and they would take the blood. The priest then would take the blood and sprinkle it on each of the four corners. They call those the horns. 
the points that are sticking up, and they would sprinkle the blood around on the four horns of the altar. And then the meat, the hide would be taken off, and the hide would be given to the Levites, and they would use the hides for clothing and for tent making and other things that you could make out of skins of the animals, wine skins and carrying bags and different things. Um, the meat, some of it, of course, all the entrails and those parts would be burned on the fire and totally consumed by the fire and burned up. And so when they burn, you know, that makes a, a smoke. And to some people, it smells good for a while until it gets to that really burnt place. Lynn's kind of wrinkling her nose. But, you know, I can smell in my neighborhood when somebody's smoking meat or cooking on the grill. I can, I can smell it through the, and it, it smells kind of good to me, at least to start with. Um, so there was some of it that would be burned up and, cons you know, totally burnt to ashes. But then there were part of it that evidently would be cooked until it was ready to eat. And then it would be eaten by the priests. And, you know, they would offer that to God. But it was part of how the priests and the Levites were fed and sustained. Was they actually would ritually eat of the meat. And later on we'll see of the bread and the wine and the other things that are there in the tabernacle. A lot of blood. Um, I imagine it was pretty smelly. I mean, they had, they were very, you know... Um, what's the word? They were very concerned with keeping things clean and neat and orderly. And of course, you know, about kosher, there's all these cleansing rituals or whatever to keep things kosher. And so I'm sure with all of that slaughter going on, it was a full-time job just keeping that all cleaned up and keeping it washed and keeping it um, sanitized in a sense, not like we think of sanitized, but at least um, keeping things from smelling and being you know, rotting and nasty. So to do that, the next thing that we come to, the bronze labor. And if you remember the diagram, these things are in order as you walk in. In the center is the altar, and then past the brazen altar then comes the laver and this was this big bowl basin it was hammered out of bronze and then it had a stand of some sort that it was you know placed in and it was pretty big um, it held quite a lot of water the the bible uses all these foreign measurements and different people have different interpretations but it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 75 gallons of water in this thing so it was a pretty big basin Enough so that the priests would gather around and wash. And pre especially, particularly, they were required to wash their hands and their feet before they would go into the tent. And so after all of this slaughter is going on, they would go in twice a day, some of them. Not, and not all of the priests did all of the things. Um, there were different ones that had different duties to do different things. But the ones who were going to go inside the tent were required then to wash. And we know that the water is a symbol of what for us today? Baptism, new life. Um, Jesus was buried and resurrected. And so baptism is a picture of going under the water and washing away our sins. Um, all that blood you can imagine they had they got blood on their hands and blood you know they're walking around in it and so the only blood that would be brought into the tent was that that was was sanctified and was used for the purpose of sprinkling the blood and the rest of them they had to be washed of it and cleansed of their sin so they would gather around and wash at this laver before they would go inside to the holy place Inside the tent, the first room, the holy place was not that big, 15 by 30 feet, roughly. Um, 
oblong, probably about the size of this center section, maybe just a little bit bigger than this center section of this room. Is, is all that that size of that part of the tent was. And there were a few things in that first room as you went in. The first thing you would see is a golden lamp stand. And we're going to show you a picture of it in just a second. And it describes it that there was a center lamp and then there were six branches, three on each side, which made a total of seven branches, like a seven-branched menorah that we're familiar with. Um, it seems from reading about it, it was more complicated than this picture would di display and even maybe than we have concept of because it, it had like on each of the seven branches, they each had a lamp that had a reservoir of oil that could sustain 12 hours of oil um, before it had to be refilled. And so there was a lot of oil getting burned. And so there was a lot, had to be you know, more than just this little candelabra looking thing. It was made out of solid gold. And this thing stood maybe five or six feet tall. I'm five something. <laughs> so, you know, this thing stood about that tall. And it's solid gold. It's estimated that it could have weighed 75 pounds. Solid gold. Does anybody know what the value of gold is today? I, don't, I was going to look it up and I didn't, but I'm sure it's over $1,000 an ounce. How much? $1,200 an ounce times 16 times 75. Anybody quick enough? <laughs> it's a lot of money. It's very valuable piece of gold, very heavy. And everything in this room and further in, everything inside the tent of meeting was either solid gold or overlaid with gold. And the people had brought, if you remember, when they built this thing, they put out the call and the people kept bringing in all of their gold and silver and precious metals and jewels and their tapestry and their their cloth that they had so that the tabernacle could be built. The other thing we're going to see in this room is the table of showbread. And perhaps you remember hearing about this. This mentioned several times throughout Scripture. And it was a very small table, 18 by 36 and about 27 inches high. Probably not too different than the communion table that we have that we serve communion from. So it's just a fairly small table. And on this small table, there were 12 loaves of bread, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And that bread was eaten and replaced once a week. Once a week, remember that. They would come together on a certain day and they would eat what was there and replace it with the fresh 12 loaves of bread. The other thing in this room is the altar of incense. And again, a fairly small, 18 by 18 by 36, just a small altar. But it was also made of wood and overlaid with gold. This is where the incense burners were put. And they had, you know, like a place for hot coals to be placed in the top. And then you would sprinkle these crushed herbs and... Um, fragrances and there were four of them a special recipe of the incense that was to be used only for this it was holy unto the Lord and they were not allowed to use these things in anything else in their, you know in their personal care in their homes only for the worship that went on in the tabernacle were these herbs and spices used for the incense so here's a picture of that golden lampstand, what it might have looked like or something like this. Um, you see it's got a pretty steady base to keep it standing upright so that it can't tip over. And in the seven branches and the scripture, the description says that there were like um, almonds and almond blooms on there. I can't really 
visualize what that looked like, but there were lamps for each of those seven branches. There was a lamp on them, as I said earlier, that could burn for 12 hours. This was lit and kept lit the whole time, perpetually lit. And they would just go in and add more oil, add more oil, add more oil, and so that the light never went out. And that's very important. And so what is light to us? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But then he also said, you are the light of the world. And that no man sets his light under a bushel and covers it, but he puts it out on the lampstand, puts it up on the hill so that it can shine and give light to the darkness. We also see lampstand, lampstands mentioned in the book of Revelation. Um, there was one for each of the seven churches. And Jesus said that we should pray that he would not take away their lampstand, their, their light. Here's a picture of the table of showbread and most all of these things had rings and poles that were made for them to be carried. And so they would slide these long poles and everything, like I said, inside was overlaid with gold. So the poles were made of wood, but they were also gold-plated to carry that when they would travel. And they had covers made for all of it. Um, something interesting in my version when I was reading it, it's, Talking about the covers were made of porpoise skins. And I thought, porpoise skins? Really? And so I had to dig into that a little bit. And, of course, there's a lot of room to interpret some of the animals that are mentioned in the Old Testament in the Bible in the Hebrew. They said badger skins. But then, you know, that's what we think about when we read it in King James. It said badger skins. But it needs to be waterproof. And so... Maybe it wasn't porpoises as we think of, but it could have possibly been seal skins or sea lion skins or some kind of sea creature that their skin was waterproof that would not allow water to permeate to keep things dry and to cover them completely. And so if we went back, and I'll have to go way back to find that picture, all the way to the back. Um, you see the tabernacle, the tent in the very back there, that's, see the cover all the way over the top of that? That's those skins that we're talking about that was, you know, waterproof, that was like what we would use a tarp for, for camping today. But all of the implements, all of the altar, the lampstand, they all had covers made for them. And the covers were made of different layers, but one of the layers was always in King James badger skins or some kind of waterproof skin. So here's a picture of the golden altar of incense. And it also, as you notice, has four horns, the points on the corners of, of the altar. Um, when the priest would bring the blood in from the sacrifice, they would anoint all of these items with blood. And, and not a lot of blood in this case, but just a sprinkle or just a touch on the four corners to symbolize that the, that the blood was the covering for sin, was the atonement for sin for the people. This incense and this smoke, it was also kept burning perpetually. They were not to let it go out. And so they would come in twice a day and fill the oil in the lamp and handle the fire, bring coals from the, the brazen altar outside, bring in some more hot coals and fresh incense on this altar of incense to keep that smoke going. And so can you imagine this fairly small room and there's these seven candle lights burning, oil lamps burning, and that creates some smoke. <laughs> And then there's this incense burning and the smoke. I mean, the whole room is just this smoky, cloudy sort of um, atmosphere, if you will. Now, this is kind of just a aside. You know, today 
the modern church got into a, a phase where they wanted smoke machines and lights and and all of that but it was to create the idea was to create this sort of atmosphere of awe or reverence or um to, to shut out whatever was in the world, outside the, the room, out in the world, and to create more of an intimate, closed-in sort of idea of a, of a space with the lights and the smoke. It's an imitation. It's not even a good imitation, but that's what they're trying to accomplish is this same idea as what's going on in this inner place, this holy place where the light of the candlestick and the, the incense is burning. I'm going to back up before I talk about the ark. So that's all in one room. Then we're going to move from there. There is a veil. And I, I didn't put the veil as a separate item here to talk about, but I needed to. Um, the veil is very important. And it also was embroidered and made, it was very thick. The veil, it was, it was a heavy curtain, but it was really more like a, a pad, almost as far as thick, seven or eight layers of fabric with things woven in between it. Very heavy, very thick veil that separated the outer part of the, the holy place from the holy of holies, the most holy place. And this veil had cherubim embroidered on it on the on the outside of it when they face it and no one except the high priest could go beyond the veil ever and if they did they died and if anybody went in there unworthily or without God calling them or without God um, sanctifying them and authorizing them to come in they died and so the priest only once a year the high priest on the day of atonement he would bring a special offering of blood from the outside where the animal was slaughtered and sprinkle the blood on all of the elements going in and then he would go all the way in beyond the veil to the holy of holy place and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. The room that that was in, which was you know, the last little bit of division of this tent of meeting, it was about 15 foot, well this says 27, well oh, that's the box. But the room itself was 15 feet square. And even some people say it was 15 feet cubed. In other words, a 15 foot ceiling. And so the whole thing was a perfect cube. And that correlates with some of the descriptions in Revelation and other places of the throne of God or of, of heaven being built four square, built like a cube so that the, the length and the depth and the height were equal. So inside this room, this cubed room, where there was no other light, there was no artificial light in this room. But it says in the scriptures that God was the light. That his glory lit this area up. So the dimensions of this, the main box was 45 inches long and 27 inches by 27 inches squared. It was made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. That's the bottom part. The box itself. And of course... There were rings on each corner where it was carried, and it was only to be carried by the priests. That was the only way that God wanted it to be transported or moved, was for the priests to carry it on their shoulders with the rods that were made for it. And that would have been under cover. There was an extra cover that went over the top of this. The lid of this box that you see on the top with the two cherubim and their wings overshadowing and they are looking down over the top of the lid. That was all solid gold. 
So another big piece of heavy, solid gold. And these angels and their wings all beaten and fashioned out of solid gold. Probably another 50 or 75 pounds worth of gold. Inside that box, the ark, there were three things. A golden pot of hidden manna. Some of the manna that they had been given. God told Moses to put it inside a golden pot. And it's thought that that, that pot was like totally sealed up. So that there was manna inside of there, but they never got to see it because they never opened it because it was totally encased and sealed up to prevent air so that it didn't rot and so that the worm, you know, it could not spoil so that it would be perpetually preserved either supernaturally or by the natural means of trying to seal it off. Anyway, there was, there was manna that stayed there for forever inside that golden pot that symbolized eternal life in Christ. It also symbolized that our life is hidden with Christ in God, the scripture tells us. And it was referred to as the hidden manna. That was the term that the Hebrews used for that manna that was in the pot inside the ark. Another article or piece that was inside the ark was Aaron's rod that budded. Um, if you remember at the ordination of the Levitical priesthood, all the tribes were each given a rod and, and they brought them and stuck them in the ground or, or planted them or whatever. And it was told to them that the one that budded would be the house that was to be the Levitical, the priests, the house of the priests, those that would represent God, those that would carry out his worship and sacrifice in the tabernacle. And so it was Aaron who was of the house of Levi, Levi, whose rod budded. And it says that it budded out and bloomed and bore almonds just by being stuck into the ground. And evidently, buds and almonds remained on it. And so at some point, that became like a, a holy article, an object to them to remind them of the authority that God had given to the priesthood. And so Aaron's rod was placed in that box. And if you remember, the box is not that long, 40-something feet long, inches long, I mean. Um, so it was not like a tall shepherd's crook. It was only just like a short walking stick, like, or maybe even like a scepter that a king would have that was you know, only maybe this long. It's just a heavy, thick piece of wood that was called the rod, which was different from a staff, which would have been longer and taller, like a shepherd would use. And then the last articles that were inside the ark are the two stone tablets containing the law, or the Ten Commandments. And of course we know there was the first set that got broken that Moses in his anger threw down and broke. And then there was a second set where God himself had written the law on the tablets. And so these were inside the ark. All that to be said, this thing was not light. But four men carried it on their shoulders. And they moved fairly slowly, and it was the ark that these men carried on their shoulders that led the way into battle. It led the way to the people as they moved from place to place. And where the ark went, they followed, and when they, the time came to stop, the ark would settle, and they would set the ark down, and then they would erect the tent around it with the gate facing east, and put all these things in here and resume that worship that was going on day and night until they moved again. And of course we know about the, the pillar of, of fire and smoke that went wherever the ark went and that's when it led them along. We know that when they came to the Jordan River, we just read this, 
that it was the ark that they carried. And when they carried the ark and stepped on the Jordan River, that the waters separated and they were able to cross over on dry land. It's going to talk a little bit about the glory, that ark where the angels were. As I mentioned before, there was no other light in that room. There was the lampstand outside, but there was no light inside other than it said God's glory shone brightly. And we know that Moses, when he went into the presence of God and came out, that he glowed. It was like radioactive he, he caught it and it made him glow so much that they had to put a veil over his face because it was too bright for them to look at. And that's why God says you can't look at me and live because his glory is that powerful. His glory is that um, all-consuming and so it was only by the, the blood that the priest was able to survive when he would go in once a year. There's several scriptures that talks about this. In Exodus 25, 22, it says, There above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony... I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. That was God speaking to Moses. And then he says, Tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place, behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover of the ark, or else he will die, because I appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. And then in Sam, 2 Samuel, which we haven't gotten to yet, it talks about the ark of God, which is called by the name. And remember, the name could not be mentioned or written, only referred to as the name. The name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. And one last one from Isaiah O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. It was a likeness of literally the throne of God. And we see it over and over again through Scripture that where the ark is, that the power of God is manifested among the people and then they once they take the holy land the promised land that they were given and they bring the ark and the tabernacle all in they brought it to a place called Shiloh and perhaps you've heard of Shiloh before so it was a small town or city about 19 miles doesn't say that there somewhere it's I believe it's 19 miles um, away from what is now Jerusalem and of course there was a city of Jerusalem which they hadn't fully taken um, yet but Shiloh is the place that the ark and the tabernacle were set up and the worship of the people was carried out in Shiloh the Bible says for 369 years it says, the whole congregation of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tent for the congregation there. The tabernacle and its sacrificial rituals of worship continued for 369 years. And then Samuel, later on, we're going to read coming up. You remember the story of Hannah and how she prayed for a child and God gave her a child and she brought her son Samuel to the tabernacle, to Shiloh, to where the priests were and dedicated and gave him to the Lord to be raised as a priest and a prophet to the Lord by Eli, who was the priest at that time. And I'm just kind of rushing through the history just to move on with the with the idea of the ark and the tabernacle. After that 369 years, the ark is captured 
by the Philistines as a result of the sin of Eli and his sons. Eli's sons, it says, were not worthy priests and they forsook the, the righteous worship of God and began to take more of the best meat for themselves. They began to take of the offerings that people were bringing for themselves. They became um, drunk on the wine that was offered there. And God was very displeased with them. And the story goes that one of the, the sons had a son who was born and his name was Ichabod. And when he was born, Eli, the father of these two young men, said the glory is departed from Israel and he fell over dead and fell over off of, out of his chair dead. And this, that child was named Ichabod. The glory has departed. Because the ark was stolen and cap captured by the Philistines. Sometime later, David, and we know the story of David, he recaptured the ark from the Philistines. And as far as we know, when the ark was captured, the old tabernacle was destroyed. And possibly even the, the altar and the other articles and only the ark itself is mentioned up, you know, at this point. But David recaptures the ark from the Philistines. And of course, you know the story to begin with. They put it on an ox cart to bring it in. And that didn't work because God said it wasn't to be carried by an ox cart. It was to be carried on the shoulders of the priests. And when they went to steady the ox cart they all died and they had to take it and put it somewhere and, and figure this out and then finally they came and, and did it the right way and they brought the priests and the poles and they brought the ark into the city of David and there David built a new tabernacle and it's referred to throughout from this point on as the tabernacle of David and it was a different sort of tabernacle. This tabernacle was just basically a canopy. It was open air. The ark sat in the middle of it and the ark was accessible to all the people. Now they couldn't come near it or touch it but they could see it and they could come to worship there in that tabernacle. And the worship that David instituted was not all about, there were sacrifices, but it was not all about the sacrifices of animals and blood, but it was the sacrifices of praise and worship. And it says that David instituted a new worship for God and that God blessed him because David was the man after God's own heart. And David began to write psalms and songs to the Lord and to train musicians and at one point in this new tabernacle, in this new worship, there were 40,000 musicians trained. I can barely read my own thing. It's so small, even with my new glasses. It was the center of a new order of joyful worship which stood in sharp contrast to the solemn worship of Moses' tabernacle. Instead of the sacrifices of animals, the sacrifices offered at David's tabernacle were the sacrifices of praise, joy, and thanksgiving. This was open worship in the presence of God, dwelling openly among his people. Apostle James, in speaking about this, spoke to the Jews in Acts chapter 15 and 16, and he quotes Amos, 9 and 11, in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. This is a prophetic word by James who was the pastor of the church or the leader of the church there at Jerusalem at that time. And talking about this new 
worship. And of course, if we go back, there were temples that were built after the model of the tabernacle. And of course, when Jesus died, we know that that veil that was in the temple was torn in two so that once again, the ark was accessible to the people by Christ, by his sacrifice. And that now we can come freely in and out of the presence of God. And that's restoring that tabernacle that David had modeled for the people of Israel. Rebuilding that kind of worship. And really that is a prophetic work of the church today. That when we come, we are free to worship. We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. We don't have to shed blood and sprinkle it all over everything. Because Jesus died once and for all. And gave his blood to be that atonement, sacrifice. He became our tabernacle. He came and dwelled among men. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus fulfilled that sacrificial system of the old covenant and of the old tabernacle. The veil of separation was torn in two from top to bottom. And we can once again enter into the Holy of Holies with only the sacrifices of praise, joy, and thanksgiving. The church today is the tabernacle. The church is called the body of Christ. The dwelling place of God. He inhabits the praises of His people. Where two or three are gathered, there He is. Amen. Be, be a tabernacle. Be a place. Have your, your body, we're told, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the dwelling place of God and the Holy Spirit. And so we're still charged to keep our temple clean, to te keep our temple holy and righteous. And of course, we know that that's only through the blood of Christ, but also, to continually wash ourselves with the water of the Word of God and with the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit and to appropriate that blood that Jesus shed and to repent and to confess and to continually be free of the stain of sin in our lives so that we can be that holy dwelling place for God to dwell in. Amen. That's all. I, yeah. um, I challenge you as you're reading through this, the Bible, continuing to read, that, and hope that this will help you visualize more about what's going on with the tabernacle and the ark and these things as we progress through the story. So you may be dismissed. Would someone like to close us with a word of prayer? Went, Rob, I'm going to look at you and might as well call on you. Lord, I thank you that you teach us how to worship you, Lord. We, we thank you for your, the awe and wonder of who you are, Lord. And we thank you most that you came to reveal yourself to us so that we could be close to you again. But I pray that you help each of us to have our hearts pure, purified by who you are, and you you. You work in each of us to, to love you the way that we were designed to do. And Lord, I thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a good week.